Hi, podcast listeners, Brittany and Marie here. We're here for another episode of the Property Management Show podcast. We hope that everybody's staying safe and at home as much as possible during these crazy times. Um, yes. Crazy times indeed, right, Marie? Yeah, definitely. And that is why we invited Greg Crabtree to our podcast today. He is the man behind the book, Simple Numbers, and he will share with us his insights on how property managers should handle their cash flow during the pandemic. He's also going to share with us some time-sensitive information and action items that you can take to help your PM business during this really hard um, and crazy times. So he's going to teach us how to hopefully weather this storm a little bit better. Grab your pen, grab your iPad, whatever you need to take some good notes, stop what you're doing and have a listen. All right, Greg, well, we are here with you. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, today, we're obviously going to be talking about um, managing hits to your cash flow during this big pandemic, COVID-19, all of the changes that are currently happening. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really a great honor to have somebody with your experience level just talking to us about things to look out for and what to expect. So really, really appreciate it. Um, with that being said, would you, would you tell our listeners a little bit of a brief background about who you are and what, what, where you come from? Yeah. So, uh, appreciate you guys having me on. Um, so my background is, you know, I've had a CPA firm for the last 33 years, and we actually, uh, in January, merged with one of the top 20 accounting firms, Car Riggs and Ingram. And so it's kind of nice going from, you know, my staff of about 40 people to now we have access to a much bigger firm with 2,000 people. Uh, and, and so this was actually a perfect timing for us because we were able to bring to that firm our business consulting expertise that we had built uh, that was based on uh, my simple numbers book that I wrote about 10 years ago and about to follow up with a new book here shortly. And then we got the benefit of having a marketing team with them, having, uh, you know, so many other resources. So Carl Riggs and Ingram have had multiple uh, task force set up. So one of the things that the listeners can do is go to CRICPA.com and there's a COVID-19 resources link that we've got webcasts that we've done on all areas of both how to manage through the cash flow crisis, how to, uh, what loans you can apply for, does business interruption insurance apply, does, uh, how does the employee benefits stack up in terms of the, the new, um, um, you know, unemployment benefits, as well as you know, the extended uh, sick leave requirements, you know, that the government passed. So those are kind of things that, I mean, this is kind of an unprecedented time that there was just a massive amount of information that had I, you know, just been our own firm, we would have been able to get some of it out, but we wouldn't have anywhere near the resources and the manpower that we've had to be able to do that. But really for me, uh, you know, my key was I wrote a book, 2011 called Simple Number Straight Talk Big Profits, which was really kind of my attempt to help entrepreneurs understand their financials in a more understandable way, but give them some guiding principles that we had seen to be just the big rocks that you need to have in place to be able to survive and thrive, you know, depending on whatever the conditions are. And, and what's really been nice to see is one of our core principles, you know, the, of our two months of operating expenses and cash, no line of credit debt, those businesses that have followed that guidance, it's been nice to see that they have not been the ones in a state of panic during, you know, this, this time of crisis and, and they, they have fared well. So, uh, so really that's, that's kind of one of those things. And, and then on top of that, we actually have, have done a decent amount of work in the property management space, both with investors as well as property management businesses to help people understand the unique relationship between those two and, uh, and some of the pitfalls to avoid in that regard. Yeah, that's awesome. And so, um, you, 
you know, you definitely have a, you know, a vast amount of experience, not just accounting, but you've been helping property management firms with their accounting as well. And so given, you know, the current state of affairs, right, everyone is um, afraid of what might happen. And um, when we go on social media, we see a lot of property managers expressing their worry about their cash flow, right? And right. so, Given that a lot of people are being laid off, there's a lot of fear that renters may not be able to pay rent um, and are out of work for an extended period of time. So um, obviously, like we want to go to solutions and how to manage that. But can we first talk about what what is the real impact of that to the bottom line of a property management company? Yeah. And, and so at the top of the list, the thing that anybody listening to this if you haven't already done it, you should be prepared to do it and be, work, you know, finding your way to, to complete it is the, the payroll protection plan loan that came out with the CARES Act. So every property management business has employees and individual 1099 contractors that count towards the base. And so the even within the last 24 hours, it is shifted to where they were looking at a more complex base of March 1st of 19 through February of 20. Now somebody with some sense decided, hey, how about calendar year 19 is good enough? And so that's now, you know, uh, we've, we've seen that work its way into the most recent uh, application form. And so if you just look back at your 2019 total wages that you paid, not to exceed $100,000 for the highest paid people, and same with contractors, add that up, divide it by 12, multiply it times two and a half, that's, there, there's a couple of other things you can add in, but mostly that, that's going to be a good enough number. So if you paid, you know, let, let's say, for example, if you paid $400,000 in qualified wages, um, uh, well, let me do a number I can easily do in my head. Let's see, let's say you do 600,000. So that's going to be, you know, $50,000 a month and 50,000 times two and a half is going to be $125,000. Well, that's, you need to be in line today with a lender. There's some national lenders, uh, sources. There's some, you know, but most every city, I mean, everybody's going to have more than likely a, a their bank's going to be what's called a seven, a qualified lender. So that's who you got to go through and get, talk to them, talk to that banker, get in line. Uh, you can go to sba.gov and download. There's an application form that you can go ahead and fill out to have. Now that's not the application itself, but that's the beginning of the information, you know, that they're going to need. And you need to have all that filled out and you need to have it ready to go. And then we expect funding probably at the earliest by the end of April, maybe first week of May. And then the eight weeks, eight week period following the date you get funded, that's your evaluation period of how you've got to spend that money and it's potentially forgivable. You will never probably ever in your lifetime see a forgivable loan from the SBA. And let's hope that we never have another crisis that requires one. But this is the first time I've ever seen it in my lifetime. And I got a few gray hairs to say I've been around for a while. So, so from that standpoint, you know, people need to apply. The, you don't, even if you're not experiencing a loss, you're having to certify that there's enough economic uncertainty in the next three to four months that this loan will be needed to get you through. I can't think of a single business that can't certify that, you know, right. in reality. And, and so therefore apply, get that. And then as, as Dave Ramsey, as many people know, as the, the financial counselor talks about, you know, spend the money on paper before you spend it in reality. As soon as you get funded, plan out how you're going to spend that money for the qualified expenditures of payroll, rent, utilities, uh, and, and interest uh, payments on, on business debt, if you have any. And then plan out, are there more people that you can cover during that eight-week period and, and maximize the forgiveness amount of the loan? We've This is a case where you, it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. And so probably where we've been doing some work and helping people through this is it's simple enough that even believe it or not, there's still people who need our help to actually fill out the application, but that's a very small percentage where we've probably given most people the help is modeling. Should you try to use all the PPP proceeds and have it forgiven 
or should you actually not spend it and use that money to get through? And I've had both occurrences in planning calls with clients. So that's really where you got to call. But where most of your, your, your listeners to this being property management businesses, don't forget about the, the maintenance guys that's a one guy contractor. That person counts in your wage base. Don't forget about the individual bookkeeper that you might hire that's an individual that you pay on a 1099. Don't forget about the cleaning lady that you pay as an individual on a 1099. Now, if these people are companies, you can't count them. But if these people are individuals, they count in your wage base. So so the, the, the government really recognize that we are in this gig economy of where there's contractors that we pay and those people need assistance and they need to be continued to be paid and count as well, you know, in that process. But that's, that's the number one thing. The next thing that you need to do is be prepared to do a sensitivity analysis of how much in rents go down that you don't get a commission on before you break even. Now, if you were, if you met, you know, so some of you have heard my talks before on property management businesses, we believe a property management business ought to run at least a 15% profitability rate. So that's kind of, you know, we, we've modeled enough of them and we've seen enough examples. You can't, you can't tell me that you can't run at 15% profit. Now you may not, but that's your choice. You're choosing to do some things that, that are probably not as good as what they should be. But if you weren't at that level of profitability, you're going to get to that break-even number a lot faster than somebody who was at 15%. I just did a session with a property owner and who has his own management company this morning, and we modeled out a 20% decline in rents. We don't know if those – they may not be vacancies. He may, he may have people that are in the apartment that just can't pay. So we looked at his sensitivity. He is, he is cash flow positive down to 20% reduction. Once he goes below 20%, okay, we start making some harder decisions, you know, in, in that process. Um, so, so that would be kind of where I would be expecting. Now, my hope is that given, given the next four months of federal supplemental unemployment insurance going on top of what the states provide, you, anybody who is laid off due to COVID-19 issues, they're getting the equivalent of about $23 an hour of, of just staying home. Um, now, that might change. And, and I, I, I've warned people that there's several congressmen that are looking into this, that they rushed this thing out. They knew they needed to get it out, and that was the right decision. So, so you could see Congress come back and, and modify those benefits. But for right now, there's pro- if somebody's laid off due to COVID-19, there probably really isn't a reason why they shouldn't be paying their rent. Now, not to say that they may be scared to death and they don't pay their rent. That's a different discussion. So we've, we've had that discussion with our property clients in terms of understanding what is their strategy. Do you give people uh, grace and add it to the back of the, the, the rent? Do you um, let them stay there and go without rent, hoping that their jobs will come back in two or three months? Because here, here's the thing, you know, everybody who was renting an apartment, the only thing that's going to constrict in the property management world of rental, rental housing, whether it's apartments or single family, is the total number of people will still need housing. It's just that we may see more shared housing that will create some variability. So you're looking at probably somewhere between a five to 10% contraction in the marketplace just because of people sharing and then obviously people walking out on leases. You can have all the written documentation you want in a lease, but when people can't pay, they can't pay. So they just leave. You know, there was even a discussion this morning that the courthouse is closed. How are you going to file for an eviction notice? You know, so, yeah, you can. I mean, there are people inside the building. You just can't get inside it. So you're having to do things much slower. Okay. You know, it, it's the, those are things that you guys are going to have to deal with as an industry that it's it, there's going to be a lot of questions. The other side of it, too, is be watchful of state and local mandates that, give coverage legally for people, even though that those people have a legal contract to, to pay rent, 
this is a case where the government may step in and void that contract just by edict. Um, you know, there's been some discussion of where you can't, they're not going to allow you to evict people. They're not going to enforce into the evictions. There's already been discussions of those things. So you got to be kind of prepared and there's going to be some people that'll play the system, you know, for one way or the other. But at the end of the day, that's a whole different discussion of you guys stick together as an industry, try to work through that best practices, but you've got to model the potential economic impact and then you've got to adjust for that. Now, if you apply for the PPP loan, the PPP will get you through June with probably no real staff cuts for your company. But post June is where I think we're going to see a lot of ripple effects. And so secondarily, once you look at the PPP loan, you might still want to consider applying for the economic injury disaster loan or what's called the EIDL. There is much confusion about the EIDL right now because people there's you'll hear people say, Oh, you can't have both. And that's not true. What you can't have is you can't have both loan. You can't apply for both loans to cover the same loss. So what we've been telling our clients is apply for the PPP first, know how much that amount is that you're going to qualify for, and then oh, go ahead and apply for an EIDL that factors in the receipt of the PPP proceeds and its forgiveness to the extent that you think it'll be forgiven. And then you can do, you can have, because you need to be marking time on the EIDL. It's probably going to take 60 to 90 days to get funded from the economic disaster loans. So, uh, but here's the good news. They've significantly streamlined the application process in the last week for the EIDLs. So about a week ago, that, that form was unusable. And so I'll give them credit. They've been working super, super hard. This is probably the most responsive I've seen government resources in my lifetime, you know, to this, you know, so, uh, so, you know, and, and that it's not easy for them to get the things done that they're doing. So I certainly appreciate, you know, the ones that have been making it happen. For sure. So you taking like just a, a couple steps back to the, the PPP, you mentioned a couple minutes ago, get in line now right. is that is it something that i mean it will will, will run out or you you could you could miss your opportunity it, it, everybody expects it will run out whether the government will my sense would be is they will probably continue funding it but i don't want to be in the second wave i want to be in the first wave right now when i say get in line there are some lenders that say apply with them today and you're filling out the lender's application, not the SBA's application. Although today, actually the treasury application is available. So most lenders are accepting the initial treasury PPP application. Now that's not all the documentation, but that at least gets you in line with that, that lender. How every lender is going to be a little bit different in terms of the queuing process of, of them processing who called them first. It may go each lender, lending officer might have their own list of who they're going to work. You know, it, it, it's one of those things. Um, you know, we, we've seen some of the national sources say apply here and you'll have a place in line and we'll work them based on how you applied. So it, it, it's kind of all across the board. Some lenders say, Hey, we're not going to think about it until it, we actually know that we can apply because your lender is who's actually making the application to the SBA portal but you're you're going through the lender or lenders going to the SBA. Yeah, so the if lender you, will have pretty broad power to kind of be judge and jury on some of this. Oh, okay. What do you tell us more what you mean by that? Well, you know, we've seen interesting circumstances of who qualifies in, in terms of uh, type of compensation. So like one question that we have outstanding is, you know, you've got a contractor who is an LLC, but they're a single member LLC who files as a Schedule C sole proprietor, well, are they a contractor to you or do they have to apply on their own benefit? The other question we have there is now, so there's, there's also people that are going to be able to apply as independent contractors for the, uh, for the PPP. And if you cover the, the contractors, can the contractor apply as well? Don't know that. I mean, there's general theory of you can't, two people can't apply for the same loss. Hard to tell, you know, so those are things that, wow. you know, like I said, you're, you're going to get into that. I think the last line of defense for the SBA and the government on this and managing it is the lender is going to have to 
you know, they've got to certify some things. And so when you look at what they're certifying, they're going to be the ones to, to approve or not approve the amount. And so that, that will probably not be 100%. I know it won't be 100% consistent across all lenders. So it just is what it is. Makes sense. And, and so it is, since this is such, it's not obviously like a normal SBA loan where mm -hmm. you need to prove income and things like that. Will, will people be turned away if they are first in line or is it almost a guaranteed type of thing? Oh, it, it I mean, I, I would think it's guaranteed. I mean, so this is, you're not proving income. You're proving that you had qualified expenses and these are right. easy expenses because they now have moved to the calendar year base period. It's going to be a lot easier for the banks to certify it. Do you have 941 payroll tax returns and W-2s for your employees? That's the main documentation. And do you, did you file a 1099? Yeah. So guess what? Guess, guess who this rewards? Everybody who's been doing it the right way, mm -hmm. not the people who have been paying people under the table. Oh, can't yeah. count that. Oh, you know, I, I you know, I, I decided to take distributions from my S corp instead of paying myself a salary that was a market wage. Oh, don't count. Yeah. I think that's a big yeah. one because um, yeah, that, that's a, a big thing that people don't think about when they look mm -hmm. at their books. They feel like it's my company. So, you know, I can decide yep. to take out whatever I need. I don't need to pay myself, you know, my wage. And so that brings me back to something you mentioned earlier, you know, point number two was to have a sensitivity analysis, right? So if mm -hmm. you are running a 15% profit, when you say yeah. that, it's very qualified, right? Like it means from the property management side, if you do real estate sales, like right. you need to know how much you're making on the property management side. And if right. you're muddying up, you know, um, both, mm -hmm. then it's harder for you to know what's your true break even point. Because basically real yeah. estate sales have stopped or all of us like slowed oh, yeah. down to yeah. almost a trickle. Right. I think the only one selling right now are deals that have already started before mm -hmm. the shutdown, right? Um, right. I, I doubt, you know, if this ends up, um, playing out longer, um, it's just going to take a, a bigger hit in the real estate market. It will in certain markets. I mean, I think, you know, there's still a lot of people working still. And I think the people yeah. who have, they're in the necessary businesses that still have income they're going to look at this as an opportunity. I mean, I, 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 my real estate sales clients are still showing homes. They're just doing it virtually. And uh, my rental management businesses are showing vacant apartments and they still have requests for their apartments. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're showing those that they can only show the vacant ones. And, and like I said, they're showing it using video. So, so there again, it, it will certainly not be as robust of an activity as we've seen, but there's going to be pockets of the country where it's still going to kind of go along okay for a while. Well, yeah, but you're I mean, right. It is, it is a little bit. It, I think yesterday was a sobering day. I mean, like I said, it, it, you know, that, that being in place for another 30 days, higher potential risk of death, you know, yeah. that the government's now kind of more accepting the potential reality. I mean, certainly we hope it's a lot less than what they predicted, mm -hmm. you know, but those, those cause people to step back a bit. Now I'm going to stay yeah. really optimistic. I think we got some really smart people. Somebody's going to figure out a way to slow or eliminate the, the deadliness of this and let's just learn to be able to live with it. We, you know, it's going to take a while to develop a vaccine, but I think, given, you know, some of the advances in biotech in the last several years, I, I have a hope that somebody's going to come up with an antiviral, um, you know, ability. And because of the potential risk of, to the economy and, and to everybody's health, you're going to see a lot more liberal approach of letting them try it, you know, and, and certainly giving people the option, you know, to, uh, you know, to deal with that treatment. But, you know, at that one, i you know, other than the remitisvir uh, antiviral drug and the uh, hydroxychloroquine, which that one's been around, but, you know, it, we, we've not seen a, a, a turning of the, of the death rate yet. And that's what I've been telling people that I've been watching more so that tells me that to me is the, the most correlated 
indicator of return to economic health is the turn in the death rate that there are a number of deaths uh, in that process. And so that's, that's the, the key indicator I'm looking at. And unfortunately it, it still keeps going up. Yeah, it does. Freaky, okay. freaky times for sure. Um, so you, you mentioned um, a lot of good, a lot of good information for business owners to definitely look into. It's like, stop listening, go right. get started on the PPP. Right. Um, yeah. So where, other than podcasts, um, the, like the one we're, we're filming right now that people might be listening to, what's a good source of truth? Because there is so much information out there. It's hard. It's, it's, it's just overload. It's information overload. And what can you trust specifically for business information um, to kind of plan accordingly? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I've been really pleased with our firm's ability at CRICPA.com. I mean, they, they've, you know, we've got uh, webinars that people can watch that have been recorded. There's slides to download. There's uh, templates and, and some things, you know, for people to be able to use. Uh, I've posted uh, on our Simple Numbers book web page. So simplenumbers.me slash crisis MGMT is, or if you just go to simplenumbers.me, there's a link on the facing page to click Great. to our crisis management templates. And so I've created a couple of videos to show people, here's the plan. If you, if you really can't afford to go hire an advisor or help somebody help you do it, here's kind of a do-it-yourself version. So, you know, that, those videos have been shared all around the world, um, you know, based on the, the connections that, that I've got in the entrepreneurial community. I've, I've, I had an email this morning from somebody in Kenya that uh, had access wow. to them and been sharing them around and um, all throughout Europe and the Middle East and, so, so those are, are good templates for, you know, for people to, to be able to look at, uh, and, and then, like I said, our, our firm's resources at the CRICPA.com, most of the, like, law firms, um, you know, that, I mean, everybody's been working overtime to put stuff out. Here's what I would say. I would probably look at, you know, like a, a firm like us, it's a CPA coming at it from the business side of things. I would look at it potentially from, you know, maybe a law firm. I'd pick one or two sources. And obviously, SBA.gov yeah. uh, is, is, is certainly the bookmark page. And then uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce had a really good summary document on the PPP, although it's, it's interesting. I mean, as good as their summary document was, it's now changed. Hey, yeah. It tells, it tells you no matter how good their information was, it, it's dated just because – there is little tweaks being done. And so this is what I'll tell everybody. Everybody who's putting out information is doing the best they can. You're going to have to give everybody a little bit of, of extension of grace in the sense that there are things that are able, nothing is 100% absolutely definite seems like, you know, so, so you just got to be, be careful from that standpoint, but I would pick three or four key sources of information rather than, I mean, I, I, I'm on so many email chains that I, I've stopped looking at everything that gets passed around. I, I've just kind of picked my two or three sources that, that I'm going to pay attention to. And, and that's worked out well. And very good advice. And so um, you were talking earlier about, you know, on top of just applying for the PPP, there's an EIDL. And um, mm -hmm. at one point you mentioned that um, business owners have to think about how they're going to use um, the various loans because yeah. they can't be used for the same losses. And so what would right. you recommend um, a property management company owner uh, do in terms of figuring out where to spend the money, how much of it to spend on X, Y, and Z um, yeah. so that it puts them in the best position? Yeah, so so I would say if you go to the simplenumbers.me crisis management page that has the sample models, there's a sample model in there that I put in for a restaurant. Now, you, you might actually think, well, what does a restaurant have to do with the property management business? Well, actually, from a capitalization standpoint, they're exactly the same. A property management business largely only has cash as their capital requirement. They don't carry receivables. They don't really have accounts payable. So you have a very simplistic, it's mostly a cash oriented business. Well, guess what? Most restaurants, what little bit they might have in receivables and inventory, they've got an equal amount of accounts payable. So their, their cash flow. So their projected losses 
are the same thing as cash. Whereas if you look on that same page where I have a manufacturing case study, we, we show a manufacturing case study where the business was expected to lose a half a million dollars, but their cash flow loss was five, was 800,000. So the cat, so in that particular business had the manufacturing business applied for $500,000 of loan support, they would have been short 300,000 because of the cash flow changes in AR and AP and deferred revenue and inventory. And, and so, so there again, you got to understand the uniqueness of your business model. And so as you model through what you think your, your losses may be, that's where you got to say, how much of that can I fund with the PPP? And if that's all I need, great, you're good. Don't go borrow money if you don't think you're going, going to need it, uh, you know, in that, in that process. But, but, and, and what we've actually also, you know, gotten people to think through is, once you model out what you think your loss is, does it make sense to go borrow money to do it, or is it better to just go dark and start another business another another day? And and there's a few examples of businesses that you know think of it the, in the retail industry. You know, right now, I mean, there's there's a concept in multi-location retail that sometimes it's cheaper to go dark than it is to stay open. And you know, when when there's no sales. You know, it, it's time to have no employees and pay nothing but rent and, and uh, minimal utilities, you know, because there's no customers. Well, you know, you're not going to go to zero as a property management business. And more than likely, I mean, unless your properties fail or you've got something, you know, in, in those cases, you know, I, I would think you're going to see, you know, my guess would be I would be planning for a 20 to 25 percent revenue reduction, even though you're managing the same amount of tenants, but your your revenue is going to go down because those people can't pay and your payment is based on what they pay. Now, here, here's something that just kind of popped into my head. You might go to the property owners and say, hey, you know, I know our our agreement is based on rents collected. Uh, I got news for you. I, I'm going to have to charge you for the people who are occupying, you know, realistically, I got to deal with the people who aren't paying. And I really need to charge you something for managing that because I'm not allowed to kick that person out. And because effectively I've collected that rent, I just didn't get it in cash. Now, once again, that's a contractual agreement. Probably they're going to say, nah, you got to, you got to help with this. I don't know. I mean, probably some people are going to figure out a way to get, pro you know, if, if I was a property owner, here's, here's the thing I got to understand. And this is the separation of property management from the investing property investing side of things The the client I was talking to this morning, you know, they're going to take up all of the lenders on postponing the, the debt and, and, you know, kick those payments, you know, down to the back end. Um, some debts, you know, depending on whether it's a Fannie, Fannie Mae loan or FHA or something like that, you got to look at each one of those agreements and say, is that a good deal? You know, when, if the deferral leads to a balloon payment in too short of a time frame, that's not a good deal to postpone those payments. If they're going to throw it to the back end of the note, well, then that property owner is getting some cash flow relief as well. And so this is where as I talk about in all business structures, we have to have a coordinated effort to get through this together, which is a shared pain from owner all the way to ultimate tenant. And you are right there in between the two. And so I, I think there's going to be some of you listening to this that will be able to go to your property owners and work out something practical and reasonable. Uh, this, if there ever was a time to say, well, there's what's written, in the agreement and there's what's realistic for everybody to be fair to each other. And if there ever was a time to look beyond an agreement, now's the time to do it. And, you know, I, I don't know of a single business right now that is doing business with their customers or their vendors to the letter of the agreement mm -hmm. based on these times. And if Absolutely. you want to have a, if you want to have a coordinated everybody's in this together mindset and have a, a, a team approach to this. I think that's where people are going to look at this. And the key is you got to be reasonable. 
But there again, I, I have one client, he's, he's got property in two different states, and one one landlord said, go pound sand when they ask him about rent deferral. And the other landlord says, hey, you know, we can work with you. Yeah. It so just two depends different, on the Two person. different outcomes. That's yeah, right. it does depend on the person. Yeah. I wonder. But the key is you got to ask. Yeah. <laughs> the worst thing, worst thing say is no. So. That's true. That's so true. I wonder, do you think that this, I mean, of co- I mean, of course, this is going to shape a lot of decisions that people make in the future after this. So could you see property management companies just in the future having minimum payments in all of their agreements, regardless of, I see people, because yeah. like okay. Marie mentioned social media earlier, I see people bringing those up like, hey, here's a new agreement I'm sending to all my owners, minimum Right. I, you, that, you, that, that's a brilliant observation, you know, because essentially the way you'd probably craft it is if I'm not allowed to evict a tenant, I still have to manage that unit. Mm-hmm. And so therefore there is an economic equivalent that should be added to your management fee. Yeah. Now, if, if you're not doing your part, if you can evict that tenant and you're not doing it, that's on you as the property manager. But if you, if you're re- prohibited, that's a cost that should be on the property owner because that is an investment issue of how local, local or state or federal rules are, are pro- prohibiting right. the ultimate return on investment of that underlying uh, property. Yeah. And so you mentioned that um, you were talking to um, an, an investor with a couple of properties in different states and advising um, him or her to kind of like just ask, right? Like, okay, mm-hmm. you're managing yeah. properties for this owner, ask each owner. Um, but I can imagine that there's a certain way to phrase it. So right. it doesn't sound um, off-putting, right? For example, to an owner, given that they might also be experiencing some cash flow issues personally. Um, and right. so how did you um, advise that person to approach the situation and breach that, um, that ask? Well, I, you know, I think you approach it in these are unprecedented times and the, the common theme of advice across all businesses is to save cash wherever you can. And these are the, you know, the rent deferral, and, and, and there again, the reason why rent deferral comes up at the top of the list is almost every rent, def- rent being paid is being backed by a fixed term loan, which all of the banks have gone to all of their fixed term debt holders and said, we will give you easily three month deferral and in some cases up to 12. I mean, we've had banks proactively contacting us, telling us, Hey, just let all your, your bank customers know that we're, you know, three months is an absolute slam dunk. And if they need 12 months, you know, if, if we're in a good equity position, no problem with a 12 months, just throw it to the back of the note. So knowing that that benefit is there, you know, what you don't want is a property owner sitting there kicking their note payment because, you know, talking to my real estate investor clients, they're saying, "Hey, I'm going to take a rent. I'm going to take a payment deferral if they'll give it to me. Why? Why wouldn't I? I mean, it, it's it's like the PPP loan. Why would I get? What? Why would I not apply for a forgivable loan? Uh, no. I mean, I'm going to do that. And and so what's really what really <laughs> reveals the character of a person is when they're getting a payment deferral and they're not passing that along to their tenants. That just tells you somebody you don't want to rent from. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, and that kind of brings us uh, to another question. So what what other things can people be doing to mitigate cash flow issues? Obviously, you mentioned the PPP. Uh, I don't yeah. know if I'm PPP. <laughs> it sounds so funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah that's become the term. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Like, I mean, because obviously the, the initial instinct is cut people. We, I mean, I have mm-hmm. friends people I know that are getting laid off because that yeah. their job isn't essential. Well, it's, well, it, it's really where your, your, your property management uh, companies are going to struggle. So if they have laid somebody off already and they're, they get the PPP proceeds, they want to hire them back. That person's going to go, nah, I'm making 23 bucks an hour on unemployment. 
and you were paying me 12. Mm, no, right. I'm not coming back. They're sitting at home watching Tiger King, drinking right. a LaCroix. So, yep. <laughs> well, and then yep. do you hire somebody? <laughs> Can Absolutely. you do that? that? Yeah. Well, that's, this, is the, this is the other hidden benefit. There are plenty of people who actually go, I don't care what the, the unemployment benefit is, I'd rather work. And so this is an extraordinary time that you'll be able to upgrade your staff. And, and so we've already seen plenty of people that like to work and want to work and they want to improve where they work that are out there looking. And so this is, you know, this is a great time to tap the free agent market. Right. Uh, and, and to be quite honest, we've had clients that, you know, this forced them to look hard at their underperformers mm -hmm. and let those people go. And then they're going to have a lot better pool of people to pick from to build their teams back. Because the PPP forgiveness loan does not require the same bodies. It's just the FTE cool. count. So That's very good I, to know. I, I'm all for upgrading staff. And we've, uh, we've already seen it in our firm. You know, we, we've been able to, we've got some people that, that we're able to hire and bring in. Um, and, and so, so that, that's a good thing. Whereas we were, we were just struggling to, to find any available breathing body, you know, that, you know, just had it just common walking around sense, much less skill. It's tough. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that's really the reason, you know, and I did, I put this in the video on my crisis management videos that I said, you know, we spent the last 10 years really struggling to build good teams. And so you want to go to the mat for your good people. Mm -hmm. But if somebody really is just taking up space, you know, that I, I got news for you. I mean, you, you got to, you need to trim those because th yeah. those people are, it, and this is a time where it exposes people that really don't add anything to the business. And, and to be quite honest, every property management business model we've looked at that wasn't profitable, it's because they've got underperformers on their team that they're paying money to that, that are not producing. And so, yeah. And so I'm, I'm really curious. So you obviously have looked at a lot of books of property mm -hmm. management companies. Um, yeah. And for you to be able to say like all the non -per like all the non profitable ones um, have laggers like in their teams. Mm -hmm. So um, the first position that comes to mind is like, oh, you know, the the people who are doing the sales calls, right? Like, mm -hmm. but is that true? Like, is that preconception true that those are the only people who can lag, or is it possible to have um, you know underperformers in other areas? Well. I mean, I think the idea is, you know, the ones that we've seen that really have struggled in profitability is they've invested a lot in a sales role and there's just not enough new customers that can be brought on for that salesperson to really justify. And so I think what you, what you end up doing, I'm more of a fan of utilizing marketing methodology to build a steady stream flow of leads. Mm -hmm. And then essentially you create a team approach to sales. Um, and I, I just had this con call with a different client, a different industry, but, but essentially we were talking about the same kind of thing. And, and I know the salespeople hate me for saying this, but I, 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 they, they can't, can't keep me from thinking this way. We have overpaid salespeople for years and centuries because we've made sales a singular human activity instead of creating a marketing and sales and customer acquisition process that's not singularly dependent on any one person. And it's a coordinated activity and it pays people for the level of effort that they do, not for a, an unintended consequence. There's times that people are doing the right things and we just don't have the sales to show for it at the moment, but that person has done valuable work that's worthy of being paid for, but it will pay off. There's times that they get a gift of the market and we overpay them for commissions on a sale that they had nothing to do with. It just landed in their lap. Mm -hmm. And I have a hard time as a business modeler creating unintended compensation for people. And so I look at comp, your, your, your responsibility as an owner is to craft a product that, or service that the market wants that is at a good value 
and then go get a team and put them on the field and execute faithfully to that plan and and pay people according to the value of, the, of what they do every day. And if you have a good strategy, if you're offering a good product or service and your team executes to that strategy, you will be successful. There is no doubt. But when we create these lazy compensation plans that says, oh, well, I'm only going to pay them if they're successful. Well, they may not be successful because you had a dumb strategy. Well, that's not on them. Then it's like, well, I'm going to, you know, but I'm going to pay them when they're successful. And then they get handed a deal that they had nothing to do with, but that's in the compensation agreement. So now you just wasted a big wad of compensation on somebody. And so, I think it's time for us. To, I, I'm in the Dan Pink, Adam Grant camp of we, we, we waste money paying commission salespeople. And if, there's a great Harvard Business Review article that Dan Pink wrote about why salespeople should be salaried. Yeah. And so I just point, you got to pay six bucks to download it, but it's the best six bucks you'll ever buy or ever pay for. Now, granted, certain industries that are just so ingrained in their thinking that you got to pay commissions to salespeople, because if you don't pay your salespeople a commission, they'll go to your competitor. Okay, you're stuck. You got, you know, you got to find a way to be the disruptor, you know. But, but I, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, um, in, in the process, the, the marketing, sales, customer acquisition process that's not singularly human dependent. Yeah. It's well, right now is a prime example of that. If you're, if mm -hmm. you're in sales, you might be doing everything that you can <laughs> to sign up, yeah. sign up new customers or sell Absolutely. whatever you're selling, but people aren't buying Sometimes. right yep. now. That's right. Exactly. So, so really, you know, I, I look at it as you're, you're trying to get people to, to understand the true essence of everybody in the property management business, not just the salesperson. Because they, they need to know the person who's collecting the rents. They need to know the person who's doing the, the rent management reports for the investor. You know, they, they need to know all of that. And, and so um, that, that, that's really kind of to me why it, it should be a team approach. Because in my firm, you know, the, the, the people that my clients love the most is not me. It's the person who's taking mm -hmm. care of them on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like it would make selling what, you know, a management agreement or getting an owner to sign up with you a lot easier or s seamless because yeah. they experience the experience before they sign well, up. Well, and you have a lot less of this, a finger pointing of, Oh, well, that's not me. That's them. Or, you know, everybody's in it together. Yeah. yeah that, that's really great. And I think like to your point, Greg, right. Um, it's not just about like, Hey, we should divvy up the tasks. I think it's just a mindset that, um, you know, sales doesn't exist in a vacuum. Like it should be thought of as like this flow, like there's mm -hmm. this ever flowing um, stuff from marketing and sales and customer acquisition. It's right. sales and marketing. They're parts of a bigger process, not their own you know, processes that are disconnected from other stuff. And if the whole company agrees that that's, that's real, then I think like it follows. I think that's what you're getting at, right? Well, I, I, I've said this, and like I said, this aggravates the salespeople of the world, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> if you do good marketing, sales is just an operational process to scope and, and do the contract, which yep. is not that big a deal. And so I, I've always believed it's, a, it's more about marketing than it is about sales. And if we you agree. communicate that, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the key. And, and I think it's just most people's marketing sucks. They, they, they have a pretty bad ability to tell their story. Why are you special? Why are you different? Don't give me a list of features and benefits. Tell me stories of why people, you know, your, your customers or your, your investors bring you, you know, cookies every month because you do a great job of taking care of it and, and doing that thing that they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that's the stories that you want to tell. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting hearing from you, Greg, because I know that your background is like in accounting and you spend a lot of time modeling businesses mm -hmm. and modeling financials. And um, like I'm a business major and a lot of times like back in school, we would always talk about like, oh, like the, the money being brought in, the deals being brought in by sales. I have to look at that. Um, but what you're saying is like, yeah, 
given my experience, you still believe that the mar- that's marketing shines in that aspect, not really the sales. Yeah. So it's oh yeah, I mean it, it it is the great black art, you know, in the sense that uh, everybody would love to put a science to it, and it's it's a little slippery for the science aspect of it. But I would say the most actively evaluated expenditure that we talk about on our monthly calls with our clients is actually the marketing effectiveness. And, and I, I am a huge fan of spending money on marketing, just make it effective. Right. And, and the big question that people always ask, well, how much should I spend on marketing? Every dollar that's effective. I mean, I, there's not a, there's not a limit of how much you spend if it's effective, yep. but you don't spend money that's not effective. And doing that evaluation is kind of hard work. But, you know, we've developed some techniques that we look at it more on a trailing economic basis of looking at marketing spend per contribution margin dollar. So if you look at, you know, for a property management business, I would look at marketing effectiveness as contribution, contribution margin for a property manager is going to be your rents collected minus your direct labor. And, and so that net contribution margin is the numerator and then the the marketing spends the denominator. So we look at it not as a percentage, we look at it as an output measure. And so you look at that on a rolling 12 basis because mm, momentary fluctuations, you know, that I'm, I, I want to filter out those things. So I want to look at a longer period of time. And so as you look at marketing spend per, or, or a contribution margin dollar per marketing spend dollar, and look at it on a rolling 12 and plot it. Is it going down? Is it going up? If it's going down, we're losing signal value of our marketing spend. What can we do differently? If it's going up, great. How can we give it a little more gas? Can it keep going up? And, and that's, that's really kind of the whole point. Yeah, I have another question. So since we're talking about, you know, spending on marketing and also that um, property management companies are currently feeling cash strapped, mm-hmm. um, you know, since four and a half, like we're for four and a half, we're a marketing company and we've already mm-hmm. seen this. Well, you're, well, you're in an industry where I could actually, so we've actually, you know, so I, I'll give you a practical example. We have a client in the travel industry and um, people aren't traveling right now. So he doesn't need to spend a dime on Google AdWords or SEO placement. But your industry, you guys are sitting right in the great opportunity of where there's going to be there. I, I've seen enough property management businesses that we modeled that there's plenty of them that are broken economically. And this will really hit them hard. Mm-hmm. And so this is the perfect time in your industry to be marketing. So uh, your, your industry would be one I would actually say not to turn off that marketing spend if they want to grow their business. Because one, if I go pick up a couple of new customers or new clients, then I've already replaced then that 20% decline that I'm planning on of the people that I have. And so I just need to go increase my customer base by 20% and I'm back to the same margin numbers that I was at, but I've created an investment that next year is going to really pop mm-hmm. me you know, to the next level. And so if you're well positioned, absolutely, you wouldn't turn off your marketing spend. Yeah. You would actually sharpen your, this is what you would actually do. You spend a little extra money on sharpening your message and telling your story as to why you're going to survive this and your competitors won't. Because yeah. here, here's, and I mentioned this on a property management call the other day, said, guess what happens during times like this? You know, what's the thing that property management companies are responsible for? They hold other people's money in trust funds for uh, deposits and, and they're handling other people's money. What happens when you have financial stress? You have the intersection of opportunity and need. What does that cause? Fraud. Danger. Danger zone. Danger, yeah. Danger zone. Well, I'm glad it, it's, I'm glad <laughs> That's good news for us because I also agree right. that you should be spending money on marketing right. because I, I mean, I talked to um, one of our clients or it was either early, it was yesterday, yeah. Dave Gorham, and he was even like, tell people this, this is great. They've, he either said that they signed up four or seven new properties this week mm-hmm. and he's just going to continue um, right. pushing it. That, and that's what we talked about. He's re, mm-hmm. we're together going to um, yeah. redefine his messaging. He's going to get the g- framework and then bring it back to us so we can help with that. Right. But it is, if you're in the, if you're able to do it financially, mm-hmm. 
it, it could yeah. be really beneficial. Yeah. Cause it, this, and this might be, um, yeah. This might be, I don't know, can't think of the right word right now. Maybe this is evil of me, but <laughs> you do have, since there are companies that are pulling back on their marketing, that's even more opportunity you have to be found oh, yeah. if you don't. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, and that shows that you're, you're active. You're taking a different stance. You're saying, hey, we're here to help. We're here to help you improve and upgrade your if there was ever a time to upgrade your property management yeah. uh, capability now's the time to do it yeah we are your we're support here. system that's right yeah. and 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 there again what you would do is come at people showing that you've got you've got a process of how to deal with um you know, how to deal with slower rent payments during this time, how to deal with evictions, uh, how to, um, how to work with, you know, giving people, you know, guidance on evaluating property performance relative to should they ask for, uh, uh, you know, payment and deferrals, you know, on their investment side of things. So the more of those things that you can do and help them continue to model it and look at it, you know, that's where you're showing that you're one step ahead of the game rather than just a rent collector. Right. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, and, that's and the, really great. That's what the weak yeah. businesses are. So, you know, to our property management, you know, company owners listening to this, now is your time to shine and show those DIYers that you're not just a rent collector because it's not just you telling them, they actually feel, you know, how hard it is to navigate these difficult times. Yeah. Well, and one thing I'm telling people to do also, we've kind of, um, and we've kind of gone through this wave where, Obviously, the market crashed over a decade ago, and we had a lot of DIY landlords going to Google and typing in, how do, how do I screen a tenant? How do I rent my home? Should I rent or should I sell if I can even sell? Like all of these questions. And we have so many clients who built the foundation of their property management company by capitalizing on those searches. And so when I'm talking to people you know, even this week, I'm like, film some videos about what's going on right now. Be the educational resource, kind of like you and your company is doing on the financial side, Greg. Um, I think that history has kind of shown us. Yeah. History has repeated itself. History has shown us that that will be successful because people are going to need help. Um, yeah, and, and really right now, I mean, at least there's some things about history we didn't repeat. I mean, I think we've managed monetary policy through this crisis so far in a much more accommodating way. And, and so some of the mistakes that were made in 08 uh, have not been repeated, uh, you know, in, in, in this time frame. So that part's good. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's still, the story's not written yet in, in its completion, but... Uh, Would you say it's just beginning... Like, yeah, unfortunately, I think we're we're still far closer to the beginning than we are to the end, unfortunately. But uh, but there again, I mean, as we said, there's there's opportunity, and those the the well built, better performing businesses will have opportunities to take advantage of this, and those that didn't follow good practices, you know, they're the herd's going to get thinned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have any other questions, Brittany? Um, I. I was just going to see um, the, the the one that I kind of was interested to hear a little bit more about was kind of the comparisons between where we could end up versus um, what's happened historically. I mean, you, you did kind of answer that in, in the sense that we are doing well, things a little bit better now. Well, so I think, so all of the models we've run so far, I've, more severely impacted uh, activity through June and then showed a start back in, um, uh, in July. And so if if that happens, I, I am more in the camp of a very strong, rapid recovery, rapid being as in, you know, it'll ramp back up through 20, but we'll back be, I think we can recover back into where we were back in, into 2021. Now, if it extend, if the shutdowns extend significantly beyond June, then we're in for a different ball game. And I, you know, we'll see I, that, that, that one, that one's going to be a, we'll see because 
the longer that you go, the more disruptive the restart is in, in getting things back. Now, here's the part I believe in. We have become in the U.S. a far more dominant private business economy you know, than a public business economy. And so we're not relying on the GEs of the world to get restarted. We're not relying on the GMs of the world to get started. We're relying on the U's and me's to get started. And, and I think that happens a lot faster because we're far more nimble. And, and I think we had, as long as we treat each other fairly and we don't stretch the payment term process. And, and what I've been really touting is, you know, one of the things that you risk in this environment is you see an ex a lengthening of AR days and a shortening of AP days to where that really creates a higher capital requirement for people to run a business. And I think the more that we can get back to normal AR payment days, normal AP support from vendors, then I believe that's the underlying power of the U.S. private business economy compared to the rest of the world. Uh, I've been able to do I, I do some international talks, and I've, I did a tour last year in East Africa and, and did several talks in the Middle East. And the biggest difference between a third world economy, in my view, and a first world economy is the speed of cash from source of vendor or service provider to ultimate payment by the customer. The more that you can shorten that time frame, the less capital required to run that business and the more effective that business can be and the more competitive that business can be. And that just really keeps the economy turning over and over yeah. and over again. And, and this is a disruption that puts pressure on that to stretch it again. And, and that's what, that's what I look at that says we get back to the humming like we were is when those AR and AP are working together to create the least amount of capital requirement for a business to turn their business over on a moment to moment basis. And as I said, property management is one of those where, mm, you know, you don't have a lot of that, but you are still reliant on other businesses that do that because it's those businesses who pay the wages of the people who rent your, your, uh, yep. your, your accommodations. And all of that feeds into the grand macroeconomic cycle. Yeah, that makes a lot of but sense. Then again, I grew up on a chicken farm, so what do I know about it? <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, like to, to wrap things up, Greg, what do you think is the most important thing that um, property managers should keep in mind as they try to survive these unprecedented times? I, you know, I, I go back to, you know, the uh, Jack Stack was the, was kind of the, he didn't originate it, but he was certainly the one that popularized the idea of open book management and not to say that people need to be doing open book management, but one of the things that Jack really touts and I learned, you know, from, from studying their business models and, and their ideas, ideals is this idea of reforecasting. It's weekly reforecasting. If there ever was a time that you need to get into your numbers and don't just look in, in the rear view mirror, you've got to learn to forecast. And that's really the templates that are on my simplenumbers.me site, you know, for this cash flow forecasting. Those are great simplified examples of a balance sheet and a PL in our capital format structure to where you can reforecast every week, you know, so we're, we're sitting here at the 1st of April. I, I shouldn't, I, and, and many, many of your people listening to this will not have March closed right now. And that, that shouldn't be the case. You should already be closed in March because it is April 1st. My book should be live. So I should know what March is and I should already have a forecast of what I think April is going to be. A week from now, I'm going to come back and look at my forecast for April again and say, a week from now, what do I think April is going to be? And then a week from that, I'm going to look at it again. And what do I think April is going to be in, in the rest of April? And what do I think May is going to be in June? And I'm going to keep reforecasting because I'm going to know more a week from now than I know today. And if you will develop that simplified, I don't need to be at the detail level, I'm just reforecasting at the big level, I will develop that forecasting muscle that will make you an infinitely better business owner than what you are today. 
That's really great. That's really, really good advice. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any more questions. This was okay. so, so helpful. Um, really, really, again, really appreciate you joining us. We're going to love to get this out to our listeners as much as possible. We will obviously be having you back in the future um, to talk about our originally planned <laughs> podcast. And again, thanks so much for allowing us to change the topic and hit yeah. this hot button topic right now and hopefully help a lot of people. Well, ho hopefully everybody found it helpful and uh, glad to help.